to John chapter 3. Well known passage. Please. John chapters, let's read from chapter 2 and verse 23. John chapter 2 and verse 23, please. Now while he, that is Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. And then down to verse 13, just for time's sake. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, said Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's pray. Father, your word is living and we read it. And in one sense, it's it's words, But these are words that were inspired by you and the writer wrote them down under your direction and they are alive today because you are the living, almighty and all-knowing God. Thank you that you know all about everyone here tonight, everyone who might possibly listen in at some stage and we ask that your living word would touch them right to the heart of where they are in their lives and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Forgive me, my glasses are in worse condition than ever. They've been chewed by a pup. (laughs) I gave him a bone to chew. It sounded like he was getting on really well. Then I realised he had made a spectacle of me. He had swapped the bone for my glasses. I wondered why I couldn't read with the bone on on my nose, but... And then I saw the dog was chewing my glasses, so... I need to go to Specsavers. You're all looking well. I need to go to Specsavers. Um, Amazing lives. I just jotted down... I've very little written down here, but I just jotted down some 
incredible lives. Some people I've met, there was a man in Garva called John Barclay, born in 1910. And uh, the first time I met John, he was in the local hardware shop. He was 89 and he was buying a new scythe. <laughs> he was expecting to live for another few years. When I rang him on his 90th birthday, his wife said, sorry, he can't come to the phone. He's painting the roof of the shed. And I hadn't been to his house, so I just assumed a garden shed. And I thought, a 90-year-old painting the garden shed. It turned out to be a hay shed. And then when I did go to his house and his wife wasn't in, John would have told me stories all about his life. And up above his fireplace was a picture of this young man of 18 in his, uh, what do they call that, the big... Busby, the big Busby, uh, he, he was on the Bearskin. Uh, he was on. He was in the Irish Guards. He left home, joined the army, and he was in doing his tour at Buckingham Palace. And he was on guard in the sentry box. And there's a picture of him standing there. He said, "That's when I was 18." He said, "Let me tell you." And it's interesting. Our Queen just died last year, and uh, she had. She had been monarch for over 70 years, so you can imagine how long ago this was, 1928, if he was 18. And he was guarding the palace, and uh, a young girl came by, or no, he, he was called to present arms, and he thought, that's really strange, you don't do that unless there's senior royals about. And in the corner of his eye, he saw a pram appearing, and there was a baby in the pram and a young girl pushing it. And he said, the girl pushing the pram was Princess Elizabeth. The baby in the pram was Princess Margaret. So nobody could, and he told me that story about a million times. So I, I know it really well. Um, it's amazing when you talk to people what, what they've done in their lives. There was a wee old lady in Garva and I used to visit her in her wee apartment in the fold. And she had really nice furniture in her apartment in the fold and I talked to her about the furniture. She said that furniture has been back and forward over the Pacific Ocean uh, four times. We went to live in Canada, we bought that furniture in Canada, then we decided to come back here for a while, then we went back to Canada, then my husband decided to retire back here, but he didn't like it back here, so we went back to Canada uh, and we got a couple of wee jobs there, but he came back every year to go to the Northwest 200. And while he was a spectator at the Northwest 200, he took a heart attack and died. She said, I had to go back over, sort out his funeral, go back to Canada, sell up or sell up what I could, and I brought that furniture back with me. <laughs> but that wee lady, and she was just a wee old lady, I said, what did you do in your life? I was the chief buyer for the furniture department of the top, uh, one of those big stores, you know, department store in, in Toronto. And she traveled the world buying stuff. And we just saw her as a wee old lady. Uh, so people's eyes are amazing. I was listening to a story on Radio 4. Now, Ivan says he sometimes listens to Radio 4. I understand why you pick and choose nowadays. But it's a story of two sisters called Ida and Louise Cook unassuming civil servants who never got married and lived with their parents and when their dad bought a radio way back before the war in the 1920s or whatever they started to listen to opera music and they got a real thing for opera and so they used to save up all their money and go to Germany because that's where the best operas were and they would travel around going to opera houses and then the war well Hitler got into power and in the 1930s, he started uh, clamping down on the Jews, and then he was going to take all the Jews away, and he wouldn't let the Jews leave the country unless they had somebody over here that had a bond for them of enough money for them to get out of the country. And these two mm. ladies, under the cover for their passion of opera, used it as a pretext to travel all over Germany, to go to opera houses, to make contact with Jewish people, get all their jewellery and, and good stuff they had, wear it on their clothes, get it back to Britain, sell it and get money put up to bring people over 
uh, into Britain. And they saved many, many lives that would have died in the concentration camps. And they were just two unassuming civil servant secretaries. So I, I thought it was amazing, just lives like that. Extraordinary lives. Here's an extraordinary life. Nicodemus. Now, uh, Neil knows it and, and Rhonda that I was talking about this at the youth meeting one night, not so long ago, but he stuck with me. I thought, what a guy. Uh, he shouldn't be where he is. He's part of the ruling council of the Jews. And Jesus has just come to the Passover festival. He's just cleared out the uh, temple. He's thrown over all the tables. He's chucked out all the cattle and the sheep. He's told the people with the doves to get out of there. And the people that were changing monies, Bureau de Chons were in there. And they were changing money so that they could have the money for the temple taxes. And probably they took a bit off the top. And there was a bit of tax on the tax because they had to make a living out of it too. And Jesus said, get out of here. How dare you use my father's house as a marketplace? And Nicodemus was probably there. After that, the Sanhedrin, that was the, the chiefs, the leading council, and he was one of them, started to hate Jesus. Thought, who is this carpenter guy coming around here, doing stuff like that, even calling the temple his father's house? And of course, there's a lot of muttering and goings on, but a lot of ordinary people, having witnessed the miracles, were putting their belief in his name. And of course, there was a lot of talk in the Sanhedrin. What are we going to do with this fella? And this is even in the early days. And people say about Nicodemus, he, he, he was... He was a courageous man. He went at night. Yes, he was scared at the start. There might have been another reason he went at night. These rabbis were good people at heart. They, they thought, lots of them thought they were going to doing the right thing. Lots of them were feather in their own nest. But many of them were good people. And this was a particularly good man. He was probably up reading through scrolls late at night, trying to find out what, who could this guy be? And so he thinks, well, I'm going to have to go and have a word with them. The others won't like it, so I'll go at night. I don't want them to know, not at this point, but I'm going to go and see this Jesus for myself. I was thinking, he, he is, he's had, a, had an audience with Jesus one to one. We grew up on Saturday night watching Parkinson. Do you remember? He used to have all the famous people on. I remember Billy Connolly being on there and telling jokes that I can't tell here. And uh, all sorts of people being on there, the Beckhams, all, you name it, they were on the Parkinson show, but nobody. And Parkinson, getting on the Parkinson show sort of boosted your feet. Who said your fame? You nearly got baptized again. Um, <laughs> this time it was sprinkling. I'll believe that's the next time. Uh, but being on Parkinson's shows nothing. Parkinson's dead and gone. Uh, imagine being with Jesus. Would you not have sneaked out at night to see Jesus if you could? I wonder have you ever? This guy was troubled. This guy had heard Jesus talking as well as seeing the miracles that he'd done. And he thought, do you know what? I know what the other guys are saying. I understand where they're coming from, but actually I'd like to hear what he had to say. Strangely enough in chapter seven, he tells them, you shouldn't judge a man until you hear what he has to say. And so he goes. And he goes to Jesus and, he, and, he, and it's night time. And I'm sure he was wondering, I wonder will Jesus be, still be up at this time of the night? And he sort of knocked on the curtain that stood for a door at wherever Jesus was. And Jesus said, come on in. And he said, oh, you're up late. He said, yeah, I've been waiting on you coming. Because Jesus knows when you're going to turn up. Lots of times I turn up to Jesus' door in the, in the wee small hours when I wake up with problems. That's when I 
get going to Jesus. It's part of the mechanism I think he has developed, for me anyway. I talk to patients in hospital, they say, I was awake in the wee small hours. So I always say to them, do you know where I go when I'm awake in the wee small hours? To say the toilet, I say yes there too. But also, I go to Jesus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And he started to spiel. He said, Rabbi, we know, we know. So we... Is he talking for the group or is he using that as sort of a bit of cover like we've all been chatting about this and uh, I think he was really saying, I, I think I know something about you. I think there's something about you. But he's using a we so it makes it easier for him to, to communicate it. And he says, we know you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. And the answer from Jesus doesn't seem to entirely connect. I, uh, it's actually 2012, 12 years in August this year, I walked into the care of the elderly building. I was only 48 at the time. <laughs> and uh, this consultant was sitting there and he looked at me and he said, you've made a remarkable recovery. And I said, why is that? Dr. John McConville, I think his name was, top, the top uh, um, consultant neurologist in, in the Ulster Hospital. He's so clever, he has curly hair and glasses, and you can see the cogs moving in his head while he's talking to you, honestly. But it, he, he saved my life in a sense, but... But when he asked me questions, of course I gave him too long an answer. So he would just butt in in the middle of the question and say, and what about such and such? And I thought, you're a wee bit rude, but you're very clever and you're doing a good job. So he wasn't being rude. He was just getting to the root of things and thinking that guy talks too much. He asked me what I'd done at the time I was working for the church. Then he thought, I think it's paid for talking. That's what it is. So, so Dr. John said to me, uh, you made a remarkable recovery. You're actually deaf. It's a good result. <laughs> you could be dead or in a wheelchair. And I thought I'd be funny, so I said to him, so down the peninsula, they'd say, I'm deaf, but it could be dead. And he nearly laughed at that. But he said, uh, and then he moved on. And then he showed me my brain on a 17 inch monitor, and my brain was a full of it. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, see that big black bit? He said, that's where a clot hit your brain. That's why you can't hear. You're a very lucky man. And I left and he sorted out, he sorted out my, my medication and everything else. And, and here I am, unfortunately for you, here I am. So, but I imagine Jesus, the brains of the universe as we read in chapter one who made all things all through him all things were made he knows everything about everybody and that introduction in chapter one again if you dare go back to it joins up with every chapter in the book he knows who nicodemus is he knows why he's there and nicodemus actually thinks he's one step ahead of this guy he's just called rabbi and he's been very kind because this guy is just a carpenter but he's no ordinary carpenter he just doesn't make things out of wood he actually made all the wood that all the things made out of wood are made from <laughs> so every bit of wood that you see at uh, something's made out of Jesus made the wood for that incredible so Nicodemus is one of the ruling council possibly some scholars believe the head of the ruling council the wisest man in Israel at the time he was wise enough to go and see Jesus have you been wise enough at some point with your troubles, with your worries, to go and see Jesus. Maybe tonight you'll wake up. Maybe before you go to bed, you'll sort this out and you'll not wake up worrying about something. Because Jesus will be the answer to your question. So Nicodemus says what he says, and then Jesus says in reply, so Nicodemus said, 
for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus, in a way, says to him, hold on, Nicodemus, you think you know what you're talking about, but actually you don't know what you're talking about. Because unless a man, and this seems like a weird thing to say, unless a man is born again, I'll tell you the truth, or verily, verily, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. What? You're talking about the kingdom of God, Nicodemus, but actually you've got 10 degrees in theology. You've got a BD, a uh, uh, Bachelor of Divinity. You've got a diploma in, in some other area you've been down in the old testament sites doing some digging you're all into archaeology you have every detail at your fingertips but actually when it comes to god you don't know what you're talking about and the only way you could know god and start to talk about god and i could explain to you who i am is that you would need to be born again now Nicodemus says a very wise thing at this point. How can a man be born when he is old? And I reckon Nicodemus is probably twice the age of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is 30 or 31. Nicodemus is possibly as old as me, nearly 60. Not as old as some people, but nearly 60. Um, and Nicodemus says, have you saw, and he's thinking in his mind, have you saw my mum these days? How can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. And he's thinking of his poor mum, and he's thinking, this is not, no. And Jesus just looks at him and says, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit, what does that mean? Well, you're born of water the first time, natural birth. And then the second time, oh, well, Jesus goes on. I, I don't need to explain this to you. Jesus does, verse 6. <laughs> flesh gives birth to flesh. You get that, Nicodemus? You have to be born of water and of the spirit. Oh. Huh? Flesh gives birth to flesh. You, you, weren't, you, you won't remember this. We, I told you this at there is a girl we know who, who says she remembers being born. That she was in a medical facility at that time. She needs to be in another medical facility. <laughs> but anyway, she says she remembers being born. She has an incredible memory. But I said, what were they saying? She said, I don't know. I wasn't speaking at the time myself. No, she didn't say it. But she says she remembers being born. I don't remember being born, but... I do know I was born. I, I stand here as a fully grown man. It took me a while to get to this size, but I was born. And all of you, looking from where I am, you were born of the flesh. You nip, nip, nip yourself. It should hurt. If it doesn't hurt, something wrong with you, right? But you're born of the flesh. You're born once. Everybody in this room has been born once. At least once. Everybody in the world right now has been born once. At least once. The problem is, if you've only been born once, you're only half born. You're actually dead. You're physically alive. You're born of the flesh. You do lots of good things. You can get 10 degrees if you're as smart as Nicodemus. You could do lots of stuff with your life. You could get the best job. You could be a premiership footballer. You could earn so much money. And Tim was showing me a YouTube video there of a guy that's bought a Rolls Royce Wraith at Marcus Rashford Christ coming out of this training session and it cost 700,000 pounds and we thought wow what a lot of money to lose just like that and then we worked out it was two and a half weeks wages for him <laughs> you could do all that with faith just being born once and then you get older and older and older and older and then you die and being born once isn't good enough because 
A man cannot see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, Nicodemus, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And you were born to be spiritual, to have God's spirit live inside you. You're dead inside. You're running around like a madman outside. You're still awake at 60 and you're out at night coming to see me. And you're alive and you're doing well and your brain's working perfectly. But you're dead on the inside. You need to be born again. You know that big house on the or it used to be a wee house on the Port of Ferry Road built and nobody ever lived in it. You know the one I'm talking about? Now it's been super built. There's also one in carried off the same that sat for years. My dad used to drive by it every time when we were going to Vermont and go, There's that house nobody's ever lived in it. And that amazed him that somebody could have that much money because he never owned a house. And somebody could build a house and never ever live in it. There's also one in Tobermore that the bus man used to always, when we were out on trips with the senior citizens, I wasn't one of them. We were out on trips, taking the senior citizens out on trips, and we would buy this house in Tobermore. And the guy said, somebody built that house, and they never, ever lived in it. They go round and they wash the windows and cut the grass and all, but nobody lives in the house. It was great on the outside. There was nothing happening on the inside. It was stupidity. Why do you build a house? To live in it. Why did God make you? Why did the one who made everything, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been, been made, in him was life, and that life was the light of man. You were made for him to live inside you, and, and you're wasting your life, which takes me, oh, John Piper wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Life. I tried to read it. I was wasting my time. <laughs> I couldn't read it, but there's a guy in my work, incredibly clever chap. I'll just say his name begins with W. Pray for W. I love the guy. He comes to me every day and he tells me about Greek mythology and all sorts of religious stuff and tells me about books he's reading. And I thought, I've got the book for you. <laughs> And I thought, stop reading Greek mythology. And he said, why? I said, don't waste your life. John Piper gave him a book, Don't Waste Your Life. He's read it. He says, you know, I actually think I believe that stuff. But he said, he says, and I think Buddha fits in with it. And I think this fits in with that fits in. Pray for him. He said, he's an incredibly clever guy. If you are not born twice, your life is being wasted firstly here you're not getting full value for your money there are premiership players who have asked jesus into their life they're not wasting their life they're making loads of money too but they're reaching people with jesus and reaching people with jesus is better than giving them a million pound of their money if they want to give me a million pound of that if you're listening to this and you need to give somebody a million pound uh, my name's Eric Reid. Anyway. But you know what? You can be born again and be anybody. You can be born once and be anybody. And in the end, it's a waste of a life. This is what Jesus says it's like if you're born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand this at this point. He said, you, you should not be surprised. I like the AV that says, or the King James, it says, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Marvel not. And I thought that was something out of a comic one time, but it's marvel. Don't, don't, don't overthink this. Don't think that's a bit weird or that's strange or, or that's a, a strange concept. You should not be surprised, it says here in the NIV, at my saying, and here's a big word, you, that's a big word, you, and the bigger word beside it is must, must, must. You know, you could live in a tent all your life. It would be cold in Northern Ireland living in a tent all your life, 
back in the day people probably managed it you could do without your car you could ride a bicycle everywhere you can do without so much stuff there's so many things that people say i have to do that before i die but there's only one thing you must do according to jesus you must be born again if you're not when you die You've lived a life separated from God. You've made your choice that you like living that sort of life separated from God. And you will spend eternity separated from God. And that will not be a good choice for you to make. You must be born again. Nobody in here has, has to think about that. There is no other option. It's either or don't do it or do it but jesus said if you want to enter the kingdom of god so that's heaven and if you don't do what he says you must be born again you do go to hell which is actually your choice you have disobeyed what he asked you to do to believe in his son and you are separated from him forever You must be born again. What's it like when you're born again? The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You come alive. You, who lives in Bally Halbert here? I have to say I do. You do. Who else lives in Bally? You do. Anybody else live in Bally Walter? We have the windiest place in the world to live. <laughs> I know. He knows. He came to fix something that the wind didn't <clears throat> like in my house and now he put it back up and sort it. But it is windy and the power of the wind can just wreak havoc down this whole planet. What was it like last Saturday? What sort of crazy mom would start to drive on the Port of Ferry Road and then turn back? Don't tell him I said that. Uh, it was crazy, but it was powerful. And if you were sitting in your house behind treble glazing glass looking out at it, it was incredible. When the Holy Spirit, and if you let him have reign in your life, that's the sort of picture Jesus is getting across to you. You come alive. The Sanhedrin doesn't tell you how to live your life when you become a Christian. Jesus Christ lives inside you, and the Holy Spirit that has come to live inside you tells you how to live your life. That's why after the 12 disciples had got over their, or 11 of them had got over their their panics and their fears about what the Sanhedrin would do to them. Within a wee while, they were up standing in the middle of the Sanhedrin saying, we don't care what you're telling us to do. We really respect you guys. We realize you're the leaders in Israel, but you've got it wrong because Jesus really was the Son of God. And we have to talk about what he told us to do and not you. So we don't mind being beat up with you guys. In fact, when we leave here, we're going to have a party because of it. And it said they left rejoicing because they suffered for talking about Jesus. Their lives became alive. They were like wind that couldn't be controlled. Have you ever let the Holy Spirit do that in your life? Sometimes Christians only half live being half being live only half of being reborn again. Nicodemus didn't. Chapter seven. He comes out of his shell a wee bit and what he comes out up in three places. Chapter 7 and verse 48. And these guys are discussing to the temple guards why they didn't bring him in. And they said to him, uh, to the temple guards, why did you not bring the man in? And the temple guards said, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. And the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees said, you mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, has any of the rulers or of the, of the Pharisees believed in him? No! And Nicodemus is sitting there. But this mob, this that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. And then Nicodemus spoke up. 
At them having said, nobody had believed from them. Nicodemus said, who had gone, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing from him? Out, sorry, first hearing him to find out what he is doing. He spoke up for Jesus. And then they said back to him, in as many words, sit there in the corner and be quiet for goodness sake. If you have no idea, a prophet doesn't come out of Galilee, Galilee, just be quiet. Well, Nicodemus never stopped thinking about Jesus. He never stopped thinking about Jesus. He kept quiet about Jesus and they kept quiet about Jesus, but the day Jesus was being buried, there were two people there. There was a man called Joseph of Arimathea. And along with him came his friend, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night, was now out in the daylight, helping to take down the body of Jesus, taking it to the, to the garden, wrapping it in 75 pounds of spices that he had carried there. What a guy! He came out and he thought, that's why I read, sorry. Jesus said, if, if the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And Nicodemus, the day he looked at the cross, he said, wow, that's what he meant. He really was the Son of God. He really was raised up. And I didn't stand up for him. And he got round to his friend Joe, and Joe and Nick said, well, we should have spoke up more at the time, but we, we were cowardly, but we'll give them the best burial. And as tears trickled down their face, and the smell of burial, nostril, uh, burial spices went up their nostrils, and they were absolutely destroyed by what had happened, they wrapped Jesus' body in cloth. And they came out as disciples of Jesus. They lost their job over this. They weren't allowed back into the Sanhedrin after this. Do you think? They lost their income. Their family lost their reputation. Everything for Jesus was now on the table. What about you? I wonder what happened on Sunday morning when they found out about it. it must have been amazing. <coughs> The one they put their trust in is alive. His spirit came to live inside these two guys. What a life. It's a life that's been born twice. Once of the flesh, which is exciting for you grandparents, I believe. Uh, it's exciting to live a life. You've only lived half a life if you don't get born twice. These guys started to live when they were about 65. Never too late. Have you been born again? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross so that our sin would be taken away so that we could be cleansed and the Holy Spirit could come and live inside of us and we'd be born again. We would be truly alive to you, the living God. We'd be like uncontrolled wind. We would have a God living in us who's all powerful and all knowing and all kind and all pure and all holy and all of his attributes would start to live and grow and change us from the inside out. Lord, I pray for those who aren't born again yet, that you'll speak to their hearts tonight. And those of us who are, Lord, help us to start living like we are truly born again. Help us to start living in love with you. And in the words of the Apostle Paul, grace to all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. <clears throat>